Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Bible Truths. My name is Chris Menzer, part-time evangelist for the 8th Street Church of Christ. This morning I want to look at a subject that is very important to all of us, or at least it should be important to all of us, as it's something that has not been used over the last couple of decades or more in churches. Believe it or not, there are hundreds, nay, thousands of people, including preachers, who have cast aside their own Bible, the Holy Scriptures, and given their own opinions or their own religious view or even political view in what they believe is right or what God wants us to do in regards to uh, our daily lives. Um, a lot of times, if you look at even worship services, they have some of these mega churches. they have what's called, considered a rock concert atmosphere. They'll have like maybe an opening act like a, a rock band or maybe a comedian or something to get the people excited, to get them all warmed up, to feel good about themselves. And the preacher will come on and preach for about maybe 20 minutes, giving nothing but a positive sermon about this, that, and the other, and basically saying, I'm okay, you're okay, if you recall that kind of... Uh, discussion from years ago. It won't, conde won't condemn anybody. There's no condemnation whatsoever about sin or anything like that. And at the conclusion of their worship service, they will offer what is called the salvation prayer. When in actuality, it is the sinner's prayer, which I've talked about before, but they call it the salvation prayer because they don't want to call anybody a sinner because that's wrong. Um, but they, these people claim then to be Christians, claim to do what is right according to scripture, but they don't even know what the Bible says about what God wants of them and what a Christian really is. We need to go back to the scriptures in order to find out what that truth is. And that's what we're going to look at today. First, let's look at the reasons why people don't want to use the Bible. The first thing that they talk about, which is something I've heard for as long as I've been a Christian, is the fact that the Bible is a 2,000 year old book and it's no longer relevant to today. Well, let's take a look at some of the things that the Bible talks about, some of the subjects, and see if it is irrelevant for today. Let's talk about homosexuality. In Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, uh, the Apostle Paul there writes, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in the lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Now, question I have for you is, is homosexuality still an issue for today? It is. Well, okay, well then I guess that's uh, something that's still relevant from the Bible. Let's look at another subject, uh, that of fornication. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all in the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Is there a problem with fornication, sex outside the marriage? Uh, the answer is yes, so that's still relevant for today. Another uh, subject that the Bible talks about is that of divorce. If you turn with me to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 19, verses 6 through 9, we'll see what uh, Jesus has to say about this. Let's we'll start with verse 6. Matthew 19, start with verse 6. It says, So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to him, Moses, because the hardness of your hearts permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Uh, look at verse 10 real quick. It says, His disciples said to him, If such is the case of man and his wife, it is better not to marry. Is divorce still an issue today? Yes, it is. And so that is also a matter of relevance. What about drunkenness? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul there writes, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 it says there, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Is drunkenness still an issue today? The answer is yes. 
Overall, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, this is a passage a lot of people should be familiar with, even if you've never seen an episode of Duck Dynasty. I'm sure you know about Phil Robertson and his statement from this particular passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkenness, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So all these things that we've looked at shows that the Bible is still relevant today. Just because we're in the 21st century and our technology has come a long way, man itself has really not improved that much over in times of the Bible. Another example people say that we don't need the Bible is that we're not under a law today. You might have heard people say that uh, the New Testament is nothing but love letters from Jesus and all the things that he wants to do for encouragement. People even quote uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, which talks about the old law being taken out and having been nailed to the tree when Jesus was crucified, saying that because the old law was crucified with Christ and taken out of the way, that we are no longer under a law. But what about uh, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapters 5 through 7? There's a lot of law in that. What about the establishment of the church in the book of Acts? talks about how the church was established and all the things that were required for worship. And what about instructions on discipline? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verses 1 through 5. This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and there was an issue with church discipline. Looking at the first five verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says there, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man had his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he has done this deed, might be taken away from among you. For I indeed am as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Here's instruction of what to do with an erring brother, and t basically to cast him out of the church. And that, to me, is law. So there is still law and we are still under the law called the law of Christ. Another example people say they want to do, with, do away with the Bible is it causes trouble in this politically correct world. Now you remember the story of Rodney King many years ago which caused the LA riots? He stated something to the effect of why can't we all just get along? A lot of people will take on that uh, take on that verse or take on that uh, statement and say it doesn't matter what church you go to we all worship the same God and other people will say, well, you believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what I want to believe. And a lot of times other people will look at us and say, we're just nothing but a bunch of male chauvinist pigs because of the fact that we won't allow our women to lead songs, lead prayers, or even preach, because that's what the Bible says. But then here's the next thing we want to look at then is what happens when we do indeed get rid of the Bible, when it no longer becomes relevant as some people want it to be. Well, men become the rule makers then. For example, the Catholic Church uh, creating the idea of the Pope, which is considered the vicar of Christ or a substitute of Christ here on the earth. The Bible then becomes a secondary, takes a back seat, and anything that the Pope decrees becomes law. Basically, what he says goes regardless of what the Bible says. Another example is that of the Mormons. They create a president and a group of apostles. But if you look in the Bible, there is no scripture to support the position of president. And the concept of the apostles were appointed by Jesus himself. If you look in the first verse of Galatians chapter 1, the apostle Paul says that he was an apostle of Christ not made by man. So there are no apostles today to appoint other apostles. So that can't be true. Another thing that happens, in other words, when men become the rule makers, is men will write books to create what they consider to be the truth. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Left Behind series written by Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye. It's a 12 or 13 uh, novel series of the concept of the premillennialists 
of the rapture and the second coming and the millennial reign of Jesus on the earth and so on and so forth. Based on this Based on this series of books, a lot of people look at that as being truth rather than what the Bible says. What about L. Ron Hubbard? I'm sure that's a name some of you might be familiar with. He was a science, uh, science fiction author who was basically bankrupt and in order to create money, he came up with the idea of Scientology. You might have heard, remember the book called Dianetics. That's what they call, I guess, the uh, manual for the body, the human body. But it's just another example of Scientology. What about Rick Warren's book called The Purpose Driven Life? Joel Olstein's book called Your Best Life Now? A story about Joel Olstein, I read an article a while ago about after one of his services, a woman came up to his wife and asked to speak to Joel and saying that she had a lot of problems and she really needed to talk to the preacher. Well, here's an opportunity for his wife to sit down with her, open up the scriptures and study from the Bible what she needed, or even direct her to one of the other ministers that they had on hand for people to counsel with. But instead, Joel Osteen's wife says, well, my husband's book has everything that he talks about. You need to have that and you'll have your answers. Are you kidding me? He has an opportunity to go to the Bible to find out what God has to say, but instead he, she promotes her husband's book. Even uh, this morning online, I found this book called Create Your Own Religion. And an individual whose name I've forgotten, he's from Italy, but he writes this book about uh, how you go about creating your own religion and basically bashing the concept of organized religion. And it shows that people will do anything they can to get away from what God says, what the Bible says, and to do what they want to do according to other men. So people will basically say, why search the Bible? Just listen to me. This goes back to the uh, Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 10, in which the people said, speak to us smooth things. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. They wanted to hear perfect things. They wanted to hear the, I'm okay, you're okay, everything is going to be fine. We're not in trouble. We're not going to be carried away in captivity or anything like that. We're going to be fine. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, if you look with me there, the Apostle Paul writes to young Timothy and says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn aside their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. And of course, that's exactly what's happening today when people are turning more to these preachers' novels or their books about what to do in order to be saved or what to do to have a great life here on earth. But Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus brings us all together and shows the error of the way by saying, Jesus came to spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. By making this statement, this is after Jesus was resurrected from the dead and before he ascended into heaven. He said, All authority has been given to me. That leaves absolutely no authority for any individual, such as a pope, such as a president, or any other individual who wants to consider themselves an authority on religion. Another example of what happens in the results of giving up the Bible is every form of living is then accepted. And unfortunately, we're looking at America and other countries today, it's become the norm. The concept of adulterous marriages, marriage, divorce, and remarriage for any, uh, any cause. Uh, homosexual relationships, drinking, gambling, violence, and so on and so forth. And of course, those who are of the religious nature, like the denominations, they'll say such thing as, it's all right, grace will cover it. You can't fall from grace. The Apostle Paul, though, says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified to the law, you have fallen from grace. Paul says that you can indeed fall from grace, even though these men say that you can't. So who are you going to believe, the Apostle Paul or these men? And again, as we stated earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, these people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So finally, let's look at what the reasons are to return to the Bible. Well, first, we know that authority in religious matters there are indeed an authoritative person. As we stated just a minute ago, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. But let's look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, if you turn with me there. 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This says the Bible has everything we need and we have no need for any other book whatsoever. That takes on any kind of creed, any kind of manual, any kind of uh, Book of Mormon or other testament of Jesus Christ or whatever you want to call it. Everything that we need is found in the Bible and the Bible alone. In 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11, Peter writes, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What Peter is saying there, if somebody is going to call themselves a preacher and stand up and talk to you about what God wants you to believe and what God tells you in order to be, how to be saved, he better have a Bible with him and have it open and be quoting scripture to tell you what is, in fact, the, indeed, the thing from God. If he doesn't have scripture in front of him as he's talking to you, then you shouldn't believe him at all. That's why when we're down at the church building and we give our lessons before the congregation, we tell people, you know, not to ask, but demand book, chapter, and verse for the things that we say, the things that we practice, and the things that we believe. If we cannot give scripture for the things that we teach, then we need to change. We need to repent of our ways. However, if there are things that you find that are indeed in the Bible, then we ask you that you should change. It's a give and take in both, in both concepts. Another example, the return to the Bible, it gives instruction concerning the church itself. Earlier I talked about looking at the book of Acts, talks about the setup of worship, but here's some other passages that we'll look at uh, concerning the name of the church. Romans 16, 16 refers to the churches, churches of Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 refers to it as the church of God. Now, some people might say, well, the name is irrelevant in regards to naming the church. Well, I have to disagree with you because if you look further in verse 28 of Acts chapter 20, it said Jesus purchased the church with his own blood, and that's when he died on the cross. Now, if he died on the cross and purchased it with his blood, then I'd say he could call it whatever he wants to. And we should be right to call it the church of Christ after him since he's the one that sacrificed his life. So the church name is relevant. Another example in regards to instruction for the church is that of worship. In John chapter 4, looking at verses 22 through 24, it says, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is... When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says there, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. As the first, uh, first church was established in the first century, after the day of Pentecost, they continued in the teaching of the apostles. Now this is not just the apostles' opinions, it's not what they came up with themselves, but it's the inspiration by Jesus in the time that they walked with him on the earth for the three and a half years of his ministry, and they continued from his teachings to teach others what is right in regards to worship and what is right in regards to all things that pertain to religion. Another example we want to look at is that of the work of the church. What is the work? A lot of people, of course, do not understand what the work of the church is, and that's why we end up seeing denomination churches with fellowship halls, gift shops, or even daycare centers because they don't really know what the work of the church is. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 12, look at verses 4 through 8. Romans 12, 4 through 8. It says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it to our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. 
These are great examples of things that we do in regards to the work of the church. If you go to a congregation or if you're just sitting there in a church service and you're doing nothing but sitting there listening to everything, then you're not participation, participating. You are simply an audience member. Those who are of the church do the work of the church and that is participating. Whether it be leading in prayer, whether it be songs, singing in songs, or following along in your scriptures when a preacher has a sermon to preach. Another example can be found in Philippians chapter 2, verse, verses 14 through 16. This goes right along with Romans 12. Philippians 2, starting in verse 14, it says there, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I might rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have run in vain or labored in vain. Another part of the work of the church is bringing other, mem bringing other people from outside the congregation in to hear what Jesus and God had to say from the scriptures. That's one of the things that we're required to do. It's one of the reasons we have this TV show, is we're bringing a message to you from God's holy word. So we might encourage you to have a Bible study with us or even come down to the church building and hear one of our lessons. Another example of returning to the Bible is discussing the concept of doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we talked about earlier about all scripture being inspired of God. But let's look at 2 John verse 9. 2 John verse 9, it says there, Whoever transgresses, or in some translation says, uh, taketh the lead, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. In other words, if an individual is preaching anything outside of the scriptures, as stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he is a puffed up individual and is basically coming up with his own opinions and not abiding by what God has already put in his scriptures. Another thing in regards to returning to the Bible is instruction for the concerning the salvation of the soul. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said, and this is after the resurrection, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That is one of our functions, not just the preacher, or not just the elders or the deacons, but every member of the congregation, every individual who calls himself a Christian is supposed to go out into the world and bring other people to Christ to show them what the Bible has to say in regards to the gospel, in regards to God, in regards to Jesus, salvation, sin, and so on and so forth. In Acts chapter 2, and verse 38, the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter then said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Once again, an opportunity in regards to salvation. Baptism is essential. I know we've driven this home many times over many sermons over the past few years, and it's still important just as today as it was back in the first century. Baptism is essential for salvation. We are not saying it is the only thing, but it is essential, and the reason we hammer it is because nobody else will. Finally, another thing we look at in regards to returning to the Bible is that there is a promise of a heavenly home. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28, the writer there says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul writes, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you will turn with me to John chapter 14, looking at the first four verses. This is uh, Jesus talking to the eleven during the Last Supper. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. So here it shows that there are a lot of reasons 
for the Bible. And in conclusion today, we look at the fact that the Bible is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. And to be honest, we need it now more than we ever have. If you look at Proverbs 23, 23 really quick, well, it says there, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Now what that means is, do everything in your power to buy the truth of the gospel. Not necessarily through money, but putting aside your old ways to put on the new man, which is of Christ, and do what is right according to God's word in the scriptures and the scriptures alone. And once you have bought that truth, do not give it up for anything in this world, whether materialistic or whether some other opinion of a man. I thank you very much for your attention this morning. If there is an opportunity that you have, you can call the the number that we have that we show up on the screen for encouragement, for questions, comments. If you want to set up a Bible study with myself or David or any other people that preach here or come down to the church building sometime on Sundays or Wednesday night and hear what we have to say in regards to God's Word. We'll do everything we can to help you understand what God has taught from His Scriptures and help you to get on your, the path of righteousness so you too can become a Christian and that you too can live eternally in heaven with the rest of us. This is Chris Menzer. I thank you very much for another episode of Bible Truths.